Okay, please confirm it that you are seeing the, um, the slides. Like. Okay. Um, yes. Hi. Ah, okay, great. Yes. So, um, so uh, well, second, uh, everyone, the first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to present my work in the first contributed talk of the workshop. So um, uh, this last month, I've been working on my master's thesis in the laboratory of Modesto Redrejo. And in this talk, I wanted, to, I wanted to present you the results of this project in which we saw how uh, PI bits, which are a new group of primary independent polymers from the family B, are associated with a plasmid and other type of conjugative elements. So these polymerases were first discovered in 2017 by our group, and uh, they have been found in diverse bacterial phyla and even mitochondria. And these polymerases conform a new major group of polybes together with the RNA prime polybes and the protein prime polybes. The biochemical characterization of these polymerases uh, show that pipal beans can perform an efficient DNA replication over both undamaged and damaged templates. And interestingly, in survival experiments in which we overexpressed uh, the people B and an inactive variant, show that uh, these polymerases may be involved in an increase in the bacterial DNA damage tolerance. Later, when we analyzed the genetic context of these polymerases, we found that people bees are mainly encoded in mobile genetic elements that are integrated into the chromosome, together with integrases and other type of uh, recombinations. However, a few of the people bees were found to be uh, encoded in circular plasmids that lack the integristin and therefore probably don't have um, an interactive form. In any case, we decided to name uh, its type of elements pipolines after the pipole being encoded in the, in the sequence. So the first uh, comprehensive study of pipolines was conducted in E. coli two years ago by our group. And in this study, we found that pipole bees were encoded in, in a few genomes of E. coli, but these genomes um, are said to, be, said to uh, represent a wide diversity of sequence type, um, serotypes, and subpathotypes. In order to characterize uh, the pipelines that were um, harbored in these genomes, our group developed a bioinformatic pipeline called Explore Pipeline. This pipeline basically uh, takes a draft genome as input and then first searches for, for a people B gene, then looks for a typical delimiting direct repeats that uh, flank the people B gene, and then um, Explore Pipeline returns the user the annotated pipeline. Uh, this pipeline is able to reconstruct the, the pipelines in case that each of the features is uh, found in different contexts, and also in case that a uh, explore pipeline the, um, doesn't find direct repeats, it returns the people be genetic context. So we test this bioinformatic uh, tool with the genomes of E. coli, and we found that pipelines in this species are uh, very flexible elements, and in fact, the only features set by all all pipelines are just the pipel B gene, the integrase, and the, the limiting direct repeats. And one of them always overlaps a tRNA gene that acts as integration site, which is a usual integration site on, of MB, um, MG element of myelitic elements like prophages. So the, um, our next goal in the lab was to perform um, a pipeline study that included all the, um, that involved all the all, all bacterial genomes. But before taking such a big step, we decided to perform um, a pipeline screen in Firmicutis, which has been recently renamed to Basilota. And there are several res reasons behind this decision. The first one is that um, Firmicutes is a, a wider taxon than E. coli, and is also evolutively far. So we expect to um, find more diversity of pipelines than in the previous study. Also, um, it's also um, known that uh, in, this in this film we find many well-known pathogen species like Streptococcus pneumoniae or Staphylococcus aureus, where MG transfers play an, plays an essential role in its pathogenicity. And the last reason is that uh, before this study, we had only described a few pipelines in Firmicutes, and all of them were plasmids. The first one is the erythromycin and alpha-plistin resistant plasmid named PLME. 300 from Limosilactobacillus fermentum. 
we also knew of the um, of the plasmid PTN SH2 from Staphylococcus, which encoded a copy of the gene FAB1, which uh, confers resistance to triclosan. And apart, uh, besides these two, we also knew of a similar plasmids to the SPTNS, like the PSE122803 from Staphylococcus epidermidis, which, uh, which just uh, varies in a few genes. So with this uh, motivation, uh, the main goal of our project was to characterize the, to perform a deep characterization of pipelines in filmicutes with the objective of uh, describing the pipeline diversity in this film and also discover if pipelines in filmicutes are plasmid that may be related to the transfer or the transference of MAR genes. So the first thing that we did was a, a massive screening of all the gene bank assemblies from filmicutes in the with, uh, with Explore Pipeline, we run Explore Pipeline with each of the genomes, and we detected pi uh, people bees in 225 uh, genomes, which are a really few per uh, percentage. However, Explore Pipeline detected uh, 243 pipelines, which means that it is um, it is possible that some of these genomes could be hosting more than more than one element. So, um, interestingly. Uh, Half of these genomes were belong to the Staphylococcus genus and half and another third to the um, Limus lactobacillus genus. But um, the rest of the genera didn't show more than six occurrences. Then we checked where was the isolation of uh, source of these genomes and we found that uh, uh, mainly the Staphylococcal genomes come from medical and human sources, but a uh, genome you know, from Limus lactobacillus come from diverse animals and but we think that these differences are mainly due to the to the um, database bias in which we have an overrepresentation of of sort of samples from medical sources. Then we perform an in silico multi local sequence typing uh, using the typing schemes in the PubMLST database in order to characterize the diversity of the of the um, of the um, strains that we had, and we found that there is a more or less wide diversity of staphylococcus sequence types. But uh, the two most abundant were the sequence type uh, 167 and the sequence type 2. The first one is absent from literature, at, at least we, don't, we have not found any publication, any recent publication that mentions it. But the sequence type 2 is a widely known pathogenic MDR strain, like the ST5 and ST8 that are also here present in Staphylococcus aureus and Staphylococcus epidermidis. Next, um, since we knew that we had um, Multi-drug resistance strains. We decided to predict the MA, the MAR genes encoded in these genomes with the MAR Finder Plus tool, and here we found that 93% of the staphylococcal genomes were predicted to be resistant to three or more MAR classes, but the genomes from, from Limus lactobacillus uh, were um, rarely showed resistance to three or more of these uh, MAR classes. However, again, we think that these, uh, these results are uh, all related to the difference in the isolation source of, of its strain. Then we checked if any of these predicted genes were in, was in our pipelines, but we only found um, a CAC genes in four of our pipelines, four of the 225, which encode for uh, pumps that um, export quaternary ammonium. And uh, in other two pipelines, we had uh, the plat genes that encode um, that confer resistance to penicillin. So these results indicate that uh, apparently pipelines are not a main a main vehicle for MAR genes, but these results are very similar to the to the results in Nikolai, where MAR genes were, were also really infrequent. However, the the biological role of the pipeline still remains to be to be discovered. So after performing a basic characterization of the genomes, we um, went to study the, the pipelines and we found that Explore Pipeline could detect um, the, the, the limit in direct repeats in, uh, in only 17 of the 243 uh, pipelines, which means that in the 90% remain, Explore Pipeline couldn't detect these uh, flanking sequences. Furthermore, when we analyzed uh, the context where a pipeline was found, 75% of them was uh, were shorter than 30 kilobespers and had sizes similar to the PLME 300 and PSC. So this um, this data is suggesting us that it is likely that our pipelines are in fact a plasmid similar to the plasmid that we already saw before. However, when we explored the annotations of, of this context, we found that only nine of them 
were annotated as plasmids. So we still don't know uh, what is happening with the remaining uh, 217 pipelines. So in order to, to ascertain if um, these uh, pipelines without direct repeats could be plasmids, we decided to create a sequence similarity network that included our pipelines and the plasmids from the PLSDB database. In this network, we used, we used FastAni to connect the sequences that uh, shared an average nucleotide identity, certain Ani, uh, of at least 90% and a coverage of at least uh, 75%. This way, we will find a uh, only uh, we'll find uh, connected only sequences that share a considerable similarity. This is the this is the um, the full network that contains all the all the plasmids and pipelines. But we can we can remove the um, the plasmids that are not connected to any pipeline because they are not so interesting now. So this is the resultant subgraph, and we can see that only we have only five connected components that contain a plasmid, which is suggestive that these pipelines could be could be plasmid or at least similar sequences to them. And then we have the, the rest of the plasmids, the rest of the pipeline, sorry, which, are, which make up around 50% that are not connected to, to, any, to any plasmid. So what we've seen on, the, on these connected components, uh, first I wanted to highlight this, uh, this big cluster in which we have 88 pipelines and six plasmids. And the interesting thing here, here is that um, when we plot the genetic structure of these pipelines, we found that these uh, pipelines, the sequences of these pipelines are um, different versions of the plasmid ptns 2 that I mentioned uh, before that was uh, described by Fury and collaborators a few years ago. And with our study, we have found like a uh, new versions that, for instance, um, have, if, um, for instance, like this plasmid that, uh, has lost the insertion sequence or this same plasmid has incorporated a composite transposer that has new genes, like the quaternary pump that we mentioned before. And so with this analysis, we are everything uh, that uh, to the best of our knowledge, we are expanding like the, the PTN SA2 like plasmid collections that we already have. So then we have uh, a few components that have pipelines similar to the plasmids PLME 300 and PSC. And finally, we have also a few plasmids that are just search sequences that have a, a one or two genes that are shared by, by some pipelines. So can, we can just discard them. So concluding, uh, concluding this section in with this sequence similarity network, we have uh, we have um, find out that many or basically almost all of the staphylococcal pipelines are plasmid very similar to the PTNSH2 and PSC. However, we still don't know anything about the topology or about the how is the elements in in, in Limosilactobacillus and the rest of genus. So with these results, we followed a second approach in order to to find more evidences of like more evidences of plasmids and this consisted in finding typical plasmid marker genes such as uh, replication proteins relaxases and all these kind of proteins in a similar way to what uh, plasmid predictions some plasmid predictions should uh, do so um the first problem that we found when we follow this approach is that um more than half of the predicted uh, functions in the in the pipelines were not annotated. This means that um, around 65% of the proteins were labeled as typical name hypothetical protein. So we decided to perform a um, functional characterization of the pipelines in order to uh, improve the pipeline annotation and at the same time uh, find these plasmid marker genes. So to perform these uh, characterizations, we uh, created a protein sequence similarity network. Then we clustered it and predicted the function of the of the clusters. We obtained uh, 470 clusters, but we will only focus on the on the main, on the most relevant ones. So, um, just one cluster had uh, was present in all the. Um, in all the pipelines, this is a present absence matrix with uh, in which we represent the, the present absence of each cluster in its pipeline, and just one cluster was present in all the in all the pipeline, which is the one that in, that involves the pipeline genes. Then the two most frequent, the two next most frequent cluster was the were two clusters that involve reservoirs and relaxases. So for now, this this data is telling us that more than half of the pipelines are at least associated mechanistically to to plasmid. Then we have five more clusters that correspond to the rest of the functions encoded in the PSA and PTNS plasmids. 
And next we have a um, two clusters that involve integrases and that are uh, frequently present in pipelines from Linux Lactobacillus. And we think that uh, this is really interesting because in uh, this heat map is this is suggesting that pipelines from Linux Lactobacillus frequently encode integrases, but also relaxes it and resolve basis, which means that it is possible that in this genus we could have both types of the of the element. And there, and we have found cases even in, where we have even found the delimiting direct, direct rapids in which we have both the integrase and a relaxes. So we think that these um, pipelines could behave similar to, to an integrative and conjugative element. So this is the full Princess uh, Hampstead heat map. And we can see that with this analysis, again, we can see that a uh, Pipeline from uh, from Staphylococcus are functionally very similar to the PSC and PTNS2, but pipeline from Limosy lactobacillus are uh, so a, a much more uh, so, uh, so a really high diversity in comparison to the to the other genomes. So uh, the last thing we did was to um, I mean. Seeing that uh, most of the pipelines encoded functions related to the DNA mobilization, like these integrases or to or, or relaxases or to or plasmids related or proteins related to the protein maintenance, we uh, performed an analysis to look for a horizontal gene transfer evidences of the people B. So uh, to this end, we um, inferred a species uh, phylogeny based on the 16S RNA gene, in which we can see that the um, the species are uh, very well separated, and we compare these three with the people with phylogeny, and we, we can see that there are uh, clear incongruences between the species and even in the genus in the Lactobacilli family that are suggesting that the, clearly, the, clearly the, there has been um, events of horizontal gene transfer of the, of the people being. So summarizing, in, with this study, we have found uh, more than 200 pipelines in Firmicutes, and Mainly, they have been found in the Staphylococcus and Limosilactobacillus genus. Later, thanks to the um, to the protein clustering and the um, sequence similarity networks, we have found that Staphylococcal pipelines are basically variations of the PSC and PTNS plasmids. And then we looked. Uh, then, when we look at the um, pipelines from Limosilactobacillus, we found out that. Uh, these pipelines are more diverse and encode functions that can be associated to both integrases and uh, to both interactive elements and plasmids. So they can be we could have both types of elements in these in these genus. Next, we saw that uh, we had uh, HGT evidences of the people begin, but there are still some questions to be answered. The first one is like uh, why is this um, this uh, is the first question that we want to answer is if this relationship between plasmids and the PIPLB is specific to Firmicutes. So we plan to uh, perform uh, the same analysis but taking all the bacterial genomes, genome assemblies in GeneBank. And then we also have um, another topics that we are currently um, carrying out in the lab, like the uh, discovering the biological role of the pipeline, which still remains unknown. And also we want to characterize new uh, biochemically new people bees from different taxa like uh, the people bees encoded in these in these plasmids or the um, people bees encoded in the mitochondrial plasmids. So um, this is everything. Thank you so much for your attention. So I think that now we can we can step to the to the questions and the discussion section. Okay, hello. Hello. Uh, thank you uh, for your talk. It was really interesting. Thank um, you. And all the talks were really interesting this session. So, is there any question in the chat? I don't see any. So, I do have a question. Uh, that is, okay. I think, for starting from Fernando, but it's uh, almost for everybody. So, Fernando, you said that PTUs, some of them have determined those strange, some of them as more wider or strange. Uh, have you checked if there is any uh, code, on usage, code on usage signature that characterize either one or the others? And on the other side, James, would you expect it to be 
any code on, because James mentioned code on usage signature before. So James, would you expect to see any code on usage signature? Uh, because my question, my idea is that Plasmid are kind of too short to find a significant code on usage signature, but I might, I might be wrong. It's just my idea. Mm. Yeah, no, we didn't check anything, you know, because uh, we have to uh, do a lot of work on yeah. many other things, but you're very welcome <laughs> to uh, yeah, get a, a, a list of all plasmids with their PTUs and uh, their host is everything in the in the published paper. We have a, a, one of the a supplemental material is a list of all 10,000 plasmids with their PTUs, their size, everything, eh? and, and also things. all connections and the host. Yes. So that you can, uh, you know, sure. that, that will be a very interesting exercise, but uh, um, I, I have no time. Have you, you have to select uh, a PTU, which is broad host range, like the hmm. PTUC, for instance. Uh, start with that one. Yeah. Because it's very large and it's large, like several hundred plasmids. And, and you can check if there is any plasmids. Yeah. Therefore, plasmids move very quickly. I remember when Eva Top did this, um, like, you know, trying to guess what was the origin of a plasmid by, by uh, analyzing the codon usage compared to different hosts. And um, she didn't find the, that codon usage was very good, but I remember she used like short camers, which are almost the same as codon usage. Well, almost the same. It's another yeah. uh, signature. And, and she could guess, she had a program to guess the origin of a, of a plasmid by the, you know, the proportion of different cameras or so. Uh, yeah, yeah, it will be interesting to be done, but I, I'm, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> maybe we should have to ask Jamie if, it's, uh, if he thinks it's worthwhile, if, we, if, if, we th if he thinks that we would find enough signal. I, th I think I'm agreeing with, with Fernando there that, that it might be very, very weak, if at all. The, the major yeah. trend in synonymous codon usage within a genome is that the highly expressed genes tend to have a codon usage that corresponds to the tRNA abundances in the cytoplasm. So those highly expressed genes are there for a long time. They're very unlike a plasmid. They're there for a long time, four and a half, thousand million years probably you know in in the sense that that they're, they're not moving around so then when you look at the the recently acquired genes and so on their codon usage is just really not well adapted to the trna abundances and therefore i don't, I don't know then they'd, they'd be quite random i think really if you were to look at them they, they wouldn't be nearly as focused as we say all the ribosomal proteins will tend to use the same kinds of codons i am almost tempted if Jamie Hall is here, if he has any idea to share on this. Uh, not seeing him, you know, but there is a question in the chat or no, that is a comment or a question. Have you seen if the same set of genes, this is for James, have you seen if the same set of genes in a certain species have di has different types of interaction or interacts with other genes depending on the ecological niche? That is exactly the kind of question we're trying to answer now with the, um, the random forest approach. So it's context, it's to try to put it into context. And, and I had a slide where I said, you know, the presence or absence of gene X could be very context dependent. You know, it's likely to be present if this gene and this gene are present, or it's likely to be present if you know, this other gene is absent, that sort of thing. So that kind of context and into your random forest, of course, you can introduce things about ecological niche or host or 
whatever you like, really. All you're really trying to do is to is to, to divide up the data in, in sensible ways at, at different steps. But uh, Jose, that's a very, very good question. That is exactly the kind of the, you know, reasoning behind why we're trying to get uh, onto this with, with um, Random Forest. And we hope to produce some software and so that people can try it with their own data sets as well. So we're not very far away, but it's just not ready yet. More question in the chat? No, nothing. Uh, then I had another question for, for Fernando, uh, which was like, uh, have you looked, because you said uh, your program shows also resistances. So have you looked at which resistances are carried in the more promiscuous uh, uh, PTUs that stay in the classes, uh, in different classes and phyla, and yep. uh, which are they? Which one are they? Because we, they we, might seem the most dangerous, like clinically or whatever. Yeah. The ones so we... yeah, there are PTUs which are apparently specialized on dissemination of antibiotic resistances, uh, and we are kind to. Uh, trying to develop a, a network of interactions to show this. You know, what are the PTUs which are apparently central in distributing the resistances? And, uh, well, we, yeah. Yeah. That's the answer. There are, uh, definitely there are some uh, PTUs which have a, a much higher antibiotic resistance gen, gene density than others. Yeah, yeah because it, it's surely helpful. Like 10 times them. more or more, yeah? Oh, well, so it's surely helpful to flag them to people doing uh, uh, outbreak uh, investigation. Yes, of them. course. Yeah. That's the idea, yeah. yeah. So, any more questions? There are no more questions so we are kind of on time um so first of all i would like to thank all the speakers it was really an amazing session and uh, yeah fantastic uh, i'm really happy you you talked in this session and uh, we can have a 15 minutes 